Good evening. Welcome in. This is The Spread. I am Cameron Tarrant. With me as always, SOCON, John Hooper. Here on this Thursday, February the 4th in 2021. John, we've made it to February. Did you see your shadow? I uh, apparently did. The groundhog apparently did see the shadow. So six more weeks of winter for us. Thanks to Tony Tarrant. <laughs> yeah. Right, yeah. I, I saw the shadow, went back into my hole. Uh, six more weeks of winter for everybody. Um, but, John, that just that means, you know, with February now here, that means we get football season in just a couple of weeks. Yeah, looking forward to it. I can't wait. Um, you know, I think um, – I read the other day where 77 of the, was it 77 or 127 of the FCS teams are going to play in the spring, which is really good. Yeah, it's not bad. Um, I mean, it's, you would, you would, you would hope for more. You would hope for more, but yeah, I mean, but I, I also think that the conferences that opted out, like, the, I mean, those teams weren't going to factor into. There's not been a major comp like a conference opt out yet. What do you mean? The Ivy League doesn't count? They don't even want to play in the playoffs. So let them do that forever. I mean, that's just so dumb. I mean, it's unfair to the student athletes, but like the fact that the presidents are sort of, you know, I, I think, think that, yeah, they're good academic schools, right. but they're not too good to play in the FCS playoffs. Yeah, it's gonna be uh, it's gonna be fun though to to watch the spring season of the uh, FCS football. We'll get into into that a little bit. Some uh, weird developments with a certain SoCon school that we can uh, dive into uh, as well. Um, but uh, we got a lot of uh, good stuff to talk about tonight, John. Um, plenty of basketball uh, action. We'll we'll get into football. Got the Super Bowl coming up uh, in just a couple of days on on Sunday evening. So got a a, a really great uh, a schedule ahead uh, in college basketball here locally. Um, you know, Furman has had about a week off now since their win on Saturday uh, over Western Carolina. It, it's been a a stretch for them now, where <laughs> they uh, have had like a week off. Uh, both their games against Chattanooga and Samford being postponed. So that means next up on the schedule is Wofford this Saturday. Yeah, it's um, obviously a rivalry game um, that Wofford's, to be quite honest with you, has I pretty much owned. I don't think there's any way around saying that. The funny thing about it is I looked up this series. There was a point from 2001 to 2007 where Furman actually won 9 of 12 in the series. Um, I think I looked at it yesterday, and since then, Wofford has won like I thought seven of 12 or 13 or yeah. something. I can't remember. But, um, you know, they've had the better of, of Furman. Now, Furman's done pretty well against them at, at home, but Furman not, has not won in Spartanburg since, let's see, 2011. Wow. Um, and so, and Furman has, I think Wofford is the last team. Let me think about this. Wofford is the last team to beat Furman at Tim and Jarena. That's Going crazy. 12, 2018 19. Game Saturday at Tim and so we'll see if Wofford can do it again. Furman unbeaten at home. Now, their road record is pretty atrocious. They're four and five on the road this year, but. At home, they're virtually unbeatable. Yeah, and they've been really good on the road. I think, you know, you take away those, you know, let's say they went and go one and one or, you know, they'd still be 500 on the road, so that would be horrible. But, uh, you know, you look at who they played, Cincinnati, Alabama, and um, went through. They've, they've had a pretty tough road schedule. Um, but having said that, you know, I think, I think this season presented a lot of different challenges. Um, 
from just stoppages. And like in football, where you can, it's it's different in one way for football. You might be rusty, but like shooting a basketball, there's nothing to like duplicate the game situation. Yeah. Somehow. So I think as much as Furman liked the break, I mean, probably for the rest aspect of it, they'd rather rather play a game this week yeah. going into such a big stretch. Right, exactly. Uh, their last performance last Saturday, a 75-69 win over the Catamounts of Western Carolina. Uh, John, here's a little bit of Bob Ritchie after the game. Slauson really changed the, the complexion of the game from the outset. They, you know, they had the steal right here where the guy's going in for the dunk and you know, he gets the block shot. And that kind of set the tone for you guys defensively the whole way. Just talk about that. Yeah, I mean, they were up 3-0. And, um, you know, we have a bad turnover. And then um, after the turnover, he chases that ball down. And uh, he could have just let it go. But fortunately, you know, he went out there and he made a play. And uh, it was a big-time play. And then we get the ball and come down and knock a three in ourselves. And, you know, it was just one of those situations where, you know, that's those, those plays where – multiple efforts and just making sure that you keep flying around and um you know we gotta we gotta continue to find some ways to do that better in some areas but for the most part you know we, we were we were we were playing with intensity necessary on both ends today so when talking about uh Jalen Slauson and the performance that he had uh against mm-hmm. the Catamounts a, a good performance uh by him um played 35 yeah. 35 minutes had 12 points uh, Noah Gurley a, a nice night 17 points for him uh, Alex, yeah, Hunter, Alex Hunter, uh, sixteen points. So some some big performances out of their you know their starting crew, and then Jalen Slauson uh, actually able to come off the bench and and produce nicely. Yeah, he almost had a double double. I think he had nine boards. Yeah, he did. Um, so yeah, I mean, uh, I just thought you know he was the one that actually made the bad pass on the on the steal right there, and um. He, 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 like he said, he could have, you know, tried to, per, he could have held off on that play. I mean, um, he didn't have to go try and block the shot because right. you, you didn't want to give up a foul there. But at the same time, you know, it was nice to see that he, you know, he hustled to make up for his mistake. And that was kind of like, I felt like that from that point in the game, it was like, it was like the momentum of that was contagious for Furman as a team. And they just kind of built off that all day, especially defensively. Yeah. Yeah. It was a a good performance. You know, Furman had had a couple tough losses uh, in there as a nice way to, to bounce back um, for them. Uh, You have an interesting story on Jalen Slauson. I I do. So I, I was watching the game and I got to thinking you know, obviously we talked about him and we've talked about Furman all year, but I never really put two and two together. But I was watching the game Saturday and I, I um, kind of started thinking and I was like, Jalen Slauson, you know, that that last name really sort of hit me, Slauson, Slauson. So I looked him up, I, I got on Furman's uh, basketball's, you know, website page, uh, FurmanPaladins.com, mm-hmm. looked up where he was from. He's from Somerville. I was like, okay. I used to live down in Charleston. Um. <laughs> And I was like, summer, and it hit me. I worked with a guy when I was in Charleston by the name of um, Tom Slauson. Mm -hmm. Tom Slauson was a professional basketball player, played in (laughs) South Carolina, um, played his college ball um, at the Citadel. No, excuse me. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Not the Citadel. He played college ball at uh, Charleston Southern. No, he played at the Citadel. You're right. Did he play at Citadel? Yeah, he's a Hall of Famer. Okay, you like looked. So you, you, you looked. You, you looked him up after. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Sorry. So he did play for the Citadel. Went and played professional basketball in France. Mm-hmm. I, I worked with him when I was in Charleston, and Jalen Slauson is his son. So obviously, the basketball genes uh, are a real thing. And uh, yeah, well, and his <laughs> his cousin played at South Carolina, uh, and then transferred to. Jacksonville. Um, so is RJ Slauson who used okay. to play at South yep. Carolina. Um, so that's a, an so, interesting, interesting bit uh, of information. Interesting. Uh, dynamic you gotta think there. if he ever gets, if like Bob Rich, you don't ever have to worry about him getting out of line, right? He's his dad went to, <laughs> to, to the oh, yeah, his, <laughs> and, and his, his his mom. The, the funny story that uh, 
the way I know this is that, you know, working with Tom and uh, kind of got to know him pretty well. He met his wife when he was over in France and his wife was like in the Air Force. So he's got two like military <laughs> parents. Yeah. <laughs> there, there's no question that he's got natural leadership skills. <laughs> yes. Not to mention all of the athletic ability of being, yeah, the, of the, being the son of a South Carolina basketball Hall of Famer. Uh, in, in Tom Slauson. So that's an interesting story there with uh, with Jalen Slauson. Um, on the flip side, it's been a rough year for Western Carolina, John. Um, yeah. Continuing to you know just be a rough year for them. Um, one good bright spot out of that Furman game, Corey Hightower, big performance uh, by yeah. him. He actually transferred there from PC. Uh, okay. Presbyte- he was the Big South freshman of the year, I believe. And good player. I mean, he's uh, he's kind of very like uh, he's like very he's very much similar to Noah Gurley in the way that he's like built, um, sort of long and and but is a good shooter has a you know the ability to like create off the dribble. So I mean, he's a really good addition for them. I I thought he'd actually. What's weird is. You know, I, at one time I thought he would make them a lot better, but they they had a couple other guys that aren't playing right now for COVID reasons or whatever, um, or just injuries uh, that would have you know like Cameron Gibson I think and Travion McRae I think uh, they they're missing them so they're missing some depth right now that they they probably wouldn't normally have but they've right. lost a lot, of, a lot of close games and then they've lost some real. Real blowouts too. Yeah, I, I don't know, man. It's 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 just been a a, a, a just a pretty bad year for them. <laughs> and we were joking at lunch, you know, it could be a really bad spring in football for Western Carolina as well. So, uh, <laughs> it may not be a good twenty twenty one at all for Catamount. Well, fans. I mean, you know, at least they get to play their games. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Um, uh, but they they start off their school in the league that, that we'll talk about that may not. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, so Furman hopefully will get to play a game again uh, on this Saturday with with Wofford, and then after that they have back to back games with UNCG. John, they have to fit in eleven conference games in twenty <laughs> days. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, going to be that'll be a good prepper for the tournament, right? I mean, yeah. I mean, three days and three three games and three days will seem simple beside that. <laughs> so hopefully they can get through those 11 games. I don't think it like, I mean, you know, the only question I would ask, I don't, I don't worry about them getting tired necessarily as much as like getting behind at school. Like, I don't think, I don't think those kids ever get tired necessarily, yeah. but you know, um, you got to wonder, I wonder more how it has an effect mentally than I do actually physically. Right. Physically, it'll be fine. Yeah. Uh, another team in the upstate uh, here, John, that had a pretty good week at basketball. Well, had a good performance this week, I should say. They got dest- – Clemson got destroyed by Duke um, over the weekend. Which is and, – and it- I can't really. I have no explanation for that. Because yeah. Duke is. Duke Let's is, look at the stats of that game. Duke has not. Was. Duke has not been good. What this did year. I like? I didn't even look at the box score. But what did Duke shoot in that game? And what did Clemson shoot? All right, let me pull it up here. So it was a seventy-nine fifty-three final score. Twenty-six point victory. <laughs> All right, Clemson ended up shooting thirty-five percent, twenty-four percent, twenty-four percent from three. <sighs> Um, Duke shot 46% and 32% from three. Gosh, well, I mean, 46% is good, but it's not, it's not 60%. You know what I mean? Like, you know, and they didn't shoot the ball great from three. Yeah. Clemson, yeah. Clemson only had, must, Clemson must have turned it over a bunch or something. Uh, Clemson only had one starter shoot over six points. Oh, wow. Amir, Amir Sims had 19. Was he the only one in double figures? Yeah, the, the next closest was um, Hunter at nine points. Oh, jeez. 
that's quite a drop off. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yes, it wow. is. Um, and, and meanwhile, for Duke, Duke had a bunch of players go with the double digits. Um, they had like four or five. Uh, yeah, they did. So it, it look, Duke has had – it's not been a great year for the Blue Devils. Um, Coach K will tell you, you know, he probably wanted to so, cancel the season earlier on this year. Now we know why. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean – Let's see. They had a guy, you know, Matthew Hurt with thirteen led led them. Yep. You know, um, Mark Williams with eleven. They had three guys with eleven: Wendell Moore and DJ Stewart. Yeah, but Clemson. So Clemson gets blown out on the weekend by Duke, and then comes back this week on Wednesday. Or no, excuse me, on Tuesday night. John, Tuesday, Super Tuesday, and beats North Carolina at you know. At Little John by double digits, uh, pretty substi- yeah, yeah, substantial, sixty-three five. to fifty. That final score. North Carolina could not hit a basket to save their oh, life. The first half really was was the difference in the game. Oh, absolutely. Clemson got out to a, a nick on him. You know, he he got off to a nice start. Clemson was shooting it well early. Um, by contrast, they were also playing well. <laughs> Funny how that works. You play well on defense, you shoot it well. Yep. <laughs> You know, one leads to the other. On the other hand, North Carolina just couldn't figure out. At times, I felt like they just couldn't figure out what they were doing against Clemson. Yeah. Because Clemson was playing such good defense. Yeah. Um, what, they had like uh, 17 turnovers? 17 turnovers to Clemson. No, that to, was five of nine. You know how good we talked about Clemson's been defending the three, and then they had yeah. those few games, but they were, they didn't, you know, bounced back against Really, North Carolina and Duke. Duke was not, you know, they didn't shoot a great percentage, and, and North Carolina was just five of nineteen. Yeah, I mean, and they didn't shoot great from the floor as a as a whole, and they really didn't shoot good from from the line either. They were eleven of twenty one from the line. Yeah, now that's pretty bad. Yeah. Whereas Clemson uh, went with nine of twelve. Let's see, Clemson got them in rebounds too, didn't it? Uh, no, Clemson got out. Yeah, well, they got out rebounded. But, three, yep. but but again, the the turnover oh. game. I mean, North Carolina had ten more turnovers than Clemson did in that game. And, That's true. That and, made up for the gap in rebound. And a lot of it was in the the first half. North Carolina. It, what's interesting is North Carolina scored the first point first points of the game. They never got a lead after that. Yeah, and then they didn't score for like nine until yeah. like nine minutes later. <laughs> Or something crazy. Um, they remember because, like, they scored the first points on like the very first possession, and then like they didn't score again until until after the first media time. Yeah, until the thirteen and a half minute mark. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> kind of like that game Clemson had, where they didn't score for forever. <laughs> yeah, you can't have scoring droughts like that against anyone. Mm-hmm. Um. I think Furman had one that was like nine minutes against ETSU. I mean, and that, that was in the that was in the second half, wasn't it? That was in the right, right. That was in that was you know they took a lead like by four. Yep. And then they just didn't score again for nine minutes. So I mean, Clemson's been one of those weird teams, man, where they've had good performances and then just getting destroyed by opponents. You know, we'll see if, you know, if they continue to play like they did with North Carolina, like they did earlier on the year, they're a tough team to beat. But then again, if, if they need to get back into the rhythm they were in at the beginning. Yeah, they they, they really do. Um, 11 and 5 record uh, right now. Uh, they get a, a big game with Syracuse uh, this weekend, John. I'll be interested to see. Syracuse not uh, as good as they have been in the past. No. Uh, but still, a, they have, a, they've been on a team that's affected by COVID. Yeah, lot. but they're still a, a dangerous team, and and then they have to turn around and play Georgia Tech, who is one of the teams that completely blew them out a few weeks ago. Yeah, that one, <laughs> that might have been. Well, I don't know. They're about equal, I guess. The, the shocking loss to to Duke because well, Duke's not Duke this year, and then, but to to lose to a Georgia Tech team that. You know, it's probably, you know, maybe middle of the pack ACC. Yeah. Like you know, you'd think Clemson at that point at least was upper 
echelon. I still think they are if they, if they can get into a, you know back to where they were at the beginning. Uh, but, of the year. But, but look, Clemson's schedule down the stretch actually is pretty favorable for them if they continue to play like they did in the North Carolina game. Look, they got Syracuse, Georgia Tech, Notre Dame, Wake Forest, Miami, and two games against Pittsburgh. Yeah. I, I will say that there's like a large separation between like. Okay, so, like, the bottom half of the ACC is not good. Like, okay, I mean, Pittsburgh is okay. Uh, Notre Dame's not very good. Lake Forest is, I mean, as much as I love C Ford, they're not, they're not where they're going to be in a few years, yeah. you know, obviously, right now. But yeah, but, it's not uh, been a good year for them. You know, I, I you know, I've kind of been shot. I thought, I thought Louisville would be a little bit better. Uh um, you know, Virginia's had some really up and down performances. You know, you talk about teams that normally are consistent. Virginia's had some some scores that were like blowout losses, like which they don't normally yeah. have. Um, it's been a, it's been a weird year for sure. Yeah, Virginia Tech was one that, that they beat. Uh, they beat up on Virginia pretty good. In basket, you know, not, it's been about I think two weeks ago. Um, Virginia Tech's been good; they've been pretty consistent, mm-hmm. um, except for that Penn State loss. I don't exactly know what happened in that game. Yeah, and look, Clemson had Virginia Tech on the ropes at one point and let him and let him off the hook in, in that game earlier on this year. So, yeah, I, and that was at their 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 place. Yep. Um. You know, and I think Clemson's in the tournament. I mean, like, if I had to pick right now, you know, I'd say probably eight, nine teams out of the ACC are are in. I mean, if you went down the standings, um, I'd say probably nine right now. Yeah. Which is about normal. I mean, that's about what we expect. I mean, pretty much every year, unless it's a really bad year. Um. You know, NC State's been real inconsistent. That's another team. Uh, of course, I guess maybe that's par for the course <laughs> for them now, um, which is kind of odd. You know, you, you think about them. You mentioned Boston College at <laughs> lunch today. They've had just a bunch of guys just opt out on them. Well, that yeah. and, and I believe what COVID has been yeah. pretty um, rampant through that. But they had four scholarship players at one point that were healthy or ready to play. <laughs> they're last. Okay, so they're three and ten and one and six in the ACC. Yeah, they're, it's, it's been a bad year for Boston College. I mean, you know, in, in Virginia, I say that about Virginia and they're eight, they, they're sitting here at eight and one with their only loss being to Virginia Tech. So, odd though, because three, only three teams are ranked in the ACC. Yeah. Florida State, Virginia Tech, and Virginia. I think Clemson will get back there if they can, you know, get finish strong. Um, Pittsburgh's been a surprise. I'll say that. I didn't expect them to be as good as they are. And Louisville's pretty good this year as, as yeah. well. Yeah, they, were, they struggled a little bit in the non-conference, but since they've got in conference play, six and three, pretty good. Um and I guess we're going to mention that the Clemson North Carolina matchup is going to be two unranked teams for the first time since Dwight D. Eisenhower was playing. <laughs> That's incredible. <laughs> so, but it, and if you look at the standings, you know, North Carolina six and four and Duke's five and four. So a big, if you look at it that way, it's a huge matchup. Um, yeah. For, you know, for, they're not, you know, neither teams that horribly out of first place. There's three, both what three games out of first, for basically and, and two look, and a half. You know, once the tournament comes around, you know, the, in, the either one of those teams could be a threat. Uh, yeah. To, to 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 maybe make a run and the uh, at the conference tournament. I don't I don't know if anybody's beating Virginia. They're just that strong. I mean, no, yeah, they they play defense so well. Um, and they can shoot the ball. I mean, yeah, it's it's hard to to stop anybody that 
that plays good defense and, and they've they got good three points. Yeah, you know, and, and can shoot the way that they do. So uh, it, it's going to be interesting coming down the stretch. I got, I got an, an interesting question for you. Who gets <laughs> – does Kentucky or, or – does Kentucky or Duke or both get left out of the tournament, NCAA tournament? Uh, well, cause I think I think Duke may have a bubble shot. Kentucky's done. Kentucky has no <laughs> – unless they were to somehow miraculously win the SEC tournament, I, I see them having no shot. So there, there, there's some major conferences talking about just canning the tournaments because most of their – teams that are going to be in it are going to already be in it, you know? Like, right. So, like, that, Kentucky would not want the SEC to do that. No, because that would <laughs> that would take away any shot for them yes. to get in the, the tournament. Right. And sometimes I think it's unfair to have conference tournaments for big, for big conferences anyway because – They'll say, well, if so-and-so wins in the 15th round of the ACC tournament, they'll get in. You know, like, <laughs> there's so many around. Like, there's some teams that get, like, a three, two-game bye or whatever. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so, like, but if you win two games, you can win your way in and then knock other mid-majors out of it when they have to pretty much get at the championship, you know to even be considered in that large, which I don't think is, I I don't think it's very fair. I think you should just award the regular season champions in bigger conferences and then just give them at large as, as you go down. I mean, it makes sense at the same time, you know, those conferences do make a good bit of money in the, well, that's true. And that's why they won't go away. And yeah, Let's be honest. I watch, who who doesn't watch the ACC tournament at Greensboro? You know. Oh right. And who isn't and fascinated by who wins it? Still, whether yep. they're in, regardless of how good they are. I, yeah. I always like to see North Carolina do play. Yep. Which you know they haven't faced off against each other all that much. I don't know. It, it, it's it's not been that much. I don't know if ever in a championship game. I. Yeah, I know they faced each other in the tournament before. I think they've faced each other a few times. Yeah, I don't know. It's going to be um, it's, it's going to be interesting. Clemson, uh, if they can um, if they can stay, you know, pretty strong down the stretch. Who knows what uh, will happen with them uh, come ACC tournament time? Um, so from Clemson basketball, John, let's move over to Clemson football. Uh, it's it was National Signing Day yesterday. Mm-hmm. Uh, the second one, they do two now. So it was the second one. And so we have all of the recruits uh, that have signed. Uh, all the recruiting rankings are in for both FBS, FCS. Um, Clemson with a very, very good class. What was their comprehensive numbers? Well, like how many did they sign both, cl- both days altogether? Uh, I think most of them ended up signing on the first day. But I, I, I feel like a lot of the guys didn't have fun signing on the, de- is it the December one. Now? Yeah, yeah. I don't think a, I don't think many signed. There, there, I think there were some, but I, I don't know that many signed yesterday. But Clemson with uh, a, a great class, several really good defensive players, some really good offensive linemen coming in. Uh, Ryan Linthicum is one of the ones that. Uh, yeah. Um, it kind of stands out there. Uh, Zaire Patterson, big defensive end coming out of Winston Salem, is going to be yeah. a, a big, um, big help on that defensive line. Uh, but I'm with Carolina producing some big time football talent. Oh, absolutely. And, and then Clemson continuing to add wide receivers. Um, got a guy out of South Central Los Angeles, California, Bo Collins coming in. Yeah. Um, some a couple of offensive linemen in there as well, but uh, Clemson continuing with quarterback play too, getting getting signing two quarterbacks from one from Georgia and the other one just down the road in Irmo, South Carolina. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know uh, they've been good at pretty much every sport <laughs> for as long as I've been alive. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so definitely, you know, and I, I wonder there was some staff changes, I guess, that were announced today or yesterday by Coach Sweeney. Um, I know you wanted to talk about that at at lunch, or we talked about a little bit at lunch today. Yes, so um, uh, news coming out uh, that uh, Clemson is uh, signed a contract extension with 
offensive coordinator Tony Elliott, um, mm-hmm. adding, uh, giving him a raise uh, and adding a couple more years to his contract. Uh, contract extended through 2026, gets another $300,000 a year. So he's up to like a $2 million. <laughs> <laughs> as an assistant, like yeah, as not the, even a head coach. Yeah, as an assistant. But you know, I was talking about it with a guy that, that I work with. Um, you know, that's that. I feel like that's part of the reason. One Dabo get like takes a pay cut so he can pay his staff more money. One because you know he's he, he's he's sort of the loyalty um, to those guys. But I feel like two, it's sort of a play. Dabo, I feel like Dabo knows if he can pay his assistants more money then they'll probably be less likely to leave for a head coaching job yeah. because because I mean look Tony's uh, Tony Elliott's making 2 million 2 million dollars there's not a lot of schools that can pay a head coach <laughs> that kind of salary million. I don't know what Matt Campbell's salary at Iowa State but I can't imagine he's 2 million dollars <laughs> yeah. like and so you know him and, and Brent Venables you know they that right that that absolute right job would have to come along in, in order for for them to to to, to leave. Um, it's just, I mean, that's smart. I mean, I mean, it is. It's smart uh, from a um, from a school standpoint. From you know, from Clemson standpoint, and uh, you have to get a coach that's not like see. So Dabo's not really interested in. He's not gonna move. I mean, this is just based off what what I think. So he's not moving anytime soon. The only people that would really yeah. move would be his assistants, and if and they would certainly move if he moved. But he's not moving. You know right. what I mean? Like right. Um, so he's going to be able to. And having said that, he's not all that worried about money. Like you have to have a coach that's not not just motivated to coach by like by because just, of money. But yeah, just making a ridiculous amount of money because. Yeah. I mean, he's he's well off. I mean, so oh, no, oh, yeah, absolutely, no, absolutely. <laughs> so, um, but that's, uh, uh, other that's co- nice to see. I think. Is- yeah, yeah, absolutely. And other coaching changes um, in in the Clemson staff. Uh, C.J. Spiller has been promoted to the full running backs coach. Now he's no longer just an offensive assistant. Um, mm-hmm. So he is the uh, the. Running backs coach now at Clemson, which is which is fantastic. I love seeing that uh, CJ. You know, Dabo does that. He loves having some of his former players come and uh, and be coaches, be assistants for him. He's got true, a couple, and he's got a couple on staff now. Yeah, and it helps the call. It helps build. You know, when you had guys that have been through it with Coach Twenty before and know the culture and know know what good times are as well as you know tougher times, and that helps to have that experience there. I mean. I, I, there's a, a big comparison you can make for, with a lot of ways with firm and basketball, you know, and a guy like Daniel Fowler and uh, being on the staff as well as like CJ Spiller being on the staff at Clemson. So those guys know what's expected of them and they, they know how to better get that across the players than maybe even a coach does because they're not as far removed from it, you know? Yeah. It, it, exactly. So things continue to look bright uh, at Clemson. However, just down the road in Columbia, things not looking so bright <laughs> for the Gamecocks as they had a just abysmal. Shane Beamer, first year head coach, has just had an abysmal um, recruiting class. Um, 78th <laughs> nationally. Which, I mean, we didn't really expect it to be out of the park. I mean, because, you know, it was so everything was kind of – it seemed like it was just thrown together by, by South Carolina when they hired him, so you can't really blame him. No, you, you can't, but look, they're last in recruiting, last in recruiting in the SEC. Van, Vanderbilt I had a better – I should be able to out-recruit Vanderbilt. <laughs> Me or you should be able to out-recruit Vanderbilt. Vanderbilt had a better recruiting class than South Carolina. And they had a coaching change too. <laughs> yeah. They hired somebody I haven't even yeah. heard of. Yeah. I mean, at least I'd heard of Shane Beamer. <laughs> um, out of all of the Power Five schools out there, South Carolina had the second worst recruiting class. Oregon State <laughs> was the only Power Five school with a worse recruiting class than South Carolina. Does that speak worse of 
the locale of maybe Corvallis is comparison to Columbia. <laughs> yeah. Maybe you should, no one wants to go to Corvallis, Oregon, which yeah. I've heard is like a farm town, so maybe not. I well, I mean, would you rather go to Corvallis, Oregon, or the, the and be in the miserable heat of Columbia down on the I think I'd rather River. go to Corvallis and take my talents to Research Stadium out there in Oregon. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, South Carolina, um, all of their recruits coming in this year are three stars. They signed zero four stars, zero five stars um, this year. They had several transfers to Chattanooga. <laughs> yeah, they've had a bunch of kids transfer out. Um, but they have had a couple kids transfer in. They've got a, a transfer from Georgia Tech, uh, a transfer from Georgia Southern, transfer from Georgia State. Smart kid that transferred out of Georgia Southern. <laughs> yeah, got a kid. They got a kid from <laughs> Nebraska coming in. Uh, Delaware State, a linebacker from the Blue wow. Hens. I don't know what to think about the, uh, <laughs> the the Delaware State Hornets having a guy leave to go to South Carolina. Oh, excuse Normally, me, that's excuse, not a excuse me. Not the not the not the horn. Not Delaware State. Del Delaware. I'm at the Blue. Oh, Hens. the Blue. The, the Blue okay. Hens. Excuse me. The Blue All Hens. Right. Excuse the me. home of Joe Biden. Yeah. <laughs> who, called, who said he went to Delaware State? Yeah. <laughs> Which Delaware State released a statement. Well, never mind. <laughs> That's a different topic. That's for a different topic. Yes. So uh not a not a great um <laughs> not a great recruiting class for South Carolina. Uh, things, you know, Shane Beamer's not even coached one game yet at South Carolina, and it's already looking like it's gonna be a yeah. disaster um, down there for, for Gamecock fans well, this year. In, in the quarterback situation, we you know we really still don't know where where that's going to go. I mean, I, mean, I, I would assume they're going to go with that fresh Doty. Was that a Doty? Uh, yeah. The freshman from last year. Helinski's He's out. He's a great athlete. Yeah, Helinski's gone. Helinski's transferring out, which I don't blame him there. Why would you stick around? And they tried to. They tried, I think they tried to. Get him to stay, and then you know that wasn't going to work. Yeah. You know, the kid comes all the way across the country. I, you know, maybe, maybe he just go to Oregon State and be started right away. Wasn't he from Washington State? Where Where is he from? California? Yeah, that's right. I believe so, so. I don't know. Have you heard where he's transferring to? I don't. I don't know. Let me see. I mean, he'd be he'll, he'd be he'd make a good quarterback. At, you know, you'd think somewhere a group of five, maybe. Mm. Oh, he, uh, North, hey, Northwestern, Northwestern. Because you know, Chase Bryce. Speaking of, is going to App State, right? Is he? Yep, transferring to App State from Duke, nice. I guess. Nice. Yeah, Ryan Holinsky is going to Northwestern. Okay, so a former home of Chase Bryce. One of his former. No, they Chase. No, no, Chase never went to. Uh, oh, that's right. Who you're was it? you're Hunter, think, uh, Hunter, Hunter. Yeah, Hunter Johnson. You're thinking of Hunter, Hunter Johnson. Johnson. Yeah, that's you're right. Thinking of him. So. Um, you know, he's got a chance. That be that's a good place for him, and he must be a very good student because Northwestern ain't easy. <laughs> so, um, hopefully, he'll get a chance to. To play, I, that's that's a program in the Big Big Ten. I always kind of mm -hmm. pull for a little bit, you know, because I always feel like they're the underdog, you know. Yep. Um, so. But I, I like Pat Fitzgerald as a you know as a coach, and I think I would probably like him as a person if I met him. But uh, so. it's uh, it's not a um, <laughs> not a good. Uh, good time in columbia right now no no uh, and i want you know i know clemson didn't they release their acc portion of their schedule yeah clemson's whole schedule has been released do we know south carolina's schedule we don't know their schedule yet do we i can look it up here real quick let's see curious is to see who their non-conference opponents are Charleston Southern may be walking out with a victory. <laughs> All right, so they they open up the season with Eastern Illinois. 
Ooh, the Panthers, former home of Tony Romo and Bob Spoo. Yep, and then they head to Dowdy Ficklin Stadium in Greenville, North Carolina. One of the many schools the out recruited them this year. <laughs> <laughs> to take on ECU before a trip to Athens, Georgia. Yikes. They could lose both of those games. <laughs> yeah. uh, then they get Kentucky at home. And then it's Which is... <laughs> and then it's a home game against Troy. Well, they could lose that one. <laughs> Uh, a, a road trip to Neyland Stadium. That could be a good game. <laughs> yeah. right there. They get. You Van- might want to circle your calendar yeah. for whatever date that is. Yeah, uh, they get Vanderbilt at home, and then it's off to Kyle Field take on the Aggies. Hey, what did Tennessee end up in recruiting rankings? That I don't know. They couldn't have been great because I think they have more people. No, they them. actually did. They actually had a pretty they rally. They actually, I think, had a top 20 class. Yeah. Which is surprising. I mean, and they probably signed a lot of those guys while Jeremy Pruitt was still. P- probably. They have, and, and they're just going to stick around and. <laughs> an opt in transfer out. Decommit. I forget. Who did they, I forget. Who did they hire again? Jo- uh, Josh Heupel, right? That's right. That's right. Yep. Josh The Heupel. former Oklahoma Sydney. You know, caller. maybe maybe he can actually do something, you know, for, for them. We'll we'll see. Well, you know, he's been able to recruit pretty well. He was able to recruit really well wh- wherever he's been. Was he at Central Florida? Is that where he was? Yeah, Central Florida. Um, and they had a bunch of success with him. Yeah, they, um, they, they did. They did. So we'll, we'll see. I, I don't. I don't know. South Carolina. I don't expect is going to have a very good year in twenty twenty one. On paper, we would say if you compare the Shane Beamer hire to Josh Heupel, there's no question. No, there's no Tennessee question. Got Tennessee got the better coach, right? Yeah. Uh, no question. No question about that. Uh, and then uh, John up here in uh, Greenville um, in the FCS level, Furman had a really good recruiting class. Um, yeah, you know, there. I believe you said you mentioned top five recruiting class in FCS. Yeah, I mean, it seems like uh, so long ago, but um, you know, that back in I guess the what would have been uh, after you know, they ranked, I'm thinking back to 20, let's see, since they hadn't they didn't play yet. They still would have that. Okay, so last time they had like the number three recruiting class in the country, and I don't think that he's rec- he's rated this one yet. Okay, but, but like, um, they signed a they signed several guys like Evan DiMaggio at linebacker, who had like eight FBS offers. I mean, like, you know, and 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 these are good programs. Like when you get a guy that. Is recruited by Army. You know, he's a pretty good player. I mean, Army's not bad. I mean, uh, you know, also, you know, he, he's pretty smart, too. Um, so, Furman's been able to get a lot of guys that go, like, in the in under Clay Hendricks, they've been able to, to steal some guys that normally go to really good military-type schools like Navy, Army or Navy. Which I think is, I mean, I think if you're stealing guys from yeah. Army or Navy, that's a whole lot different than stealing a guy from like nothing against like, because they have been good the past couple of years, but Tulane or somewhere yeah. like that, because you know they got to be pretty good at those. Those two programs are pretty consistently good now. Yeah, I, I know that yep. Navy had a little bit of a down year, but ordinarily now with Munkin at Army. They're, they're pretty good all the time. Yeah, and then yesterday, I mean, Furman already had 15 guys signed before before yesterday, and then they get um, Jordan Bass, the defensive tackle out of Raleigh, North Carolina, mm-hmm. who also yeah. who also had 50, or excuse me, 13 FBS offers. <laughs> yeah, so, like, I mean, you know, it's, they're getting guys that, you know, some guys are, like, they got two guys in that, I guess that would have been 2019 who haven't played yet uh, that were three stars, which is like, unheard. I mean, not unheard of for FCS schools, but you don't see a lot of it. Um, you saw a little bit of App State, but 
and and Georgia Southern, but uh, you don't see it quite as much anymore. I think probably North Dakota State gets a lot of those guys now, three three stars. I think Trey Lance, when he came there, was a four star um, quarterback, which is crazy. <laughs> but uh, you don't see a lot of that, and and I was impressed. You know, you you look around the league. I mean, there's impressive. I thought Chattanooga signed a really good class. I thought East Tennessee State made some nice pickups. With and they got a, they had a guy transfer from Liberty. Yeah. Um, I think another one from uh, if, I, if uh, memory serves me correctly, North Dakota State, a lineman. Um. So, not only at Furman, but I think around the league, I think that it was a really good you know, a recruiting class for a lot of teams. I saw where Citadel had a guy, was it decommit from Army or Navy and come to Citadel, I believe. Um, so mm-hmm. you're, you're starting to see more of that, um, which is good. I think the, I think the SOCON as a whole needs needs an upgrade. <laughs> and, um, uh, you know, as far as, football is concerned right and i think i think the commissioner knows that a little bit right right exactly so i don't know it's going to be uh it's going to be a really fun fcs season there's going to be some really good players coming in uh around the league in the socon Furman getting a good class you mentioned chattanooga however Which is really odd because you know chattanooga you know how much social media has been a, a really a big factor for a lot of these fcs schools well after the, I won't go into what happened at Chattanooga, but you know what we talked about a few weeks yeah, ago. Yeah, 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 yeah. There had been, so, like, I think there had been like a sign, sort of a silence on social media, and they they signed a really good class despite all, all of that. So I thought that was a nice job from Coach Wright and his staff to, to kind of, even though they had like a, maybe a. I guess, for lack of better terms, a quarantine social media aspect, they they were able to still sign a very good class. Well, and in Chattanooga, also in the news here recently, as far as football, because we hadn't even kicked the season off, and already there is some concern that Chattanooga may not play its first two games scheduled in February. That's such a nightmare because – you know, here you are, you got to be, you know, you know, that coaching staff's got to be like, just, you know, I'd be angry. I mean, I'd be honest with you. If it weren't me, if I was that coach. I mean, like, so now they're, I, I guess there's some renovation project or something scheduled. They don't, Chattanooga doesn't own their stadium. So the city of Chattanooga owns the Finley Stadium. Right. And so that's where, you know, the disconnect is, is like they don't really control. They can't just say we're playing football here. You know, they have to – if if the city's doing something or quarantining the stadium because of COVID, they have to, like – they have to either find another place to play or, you know, just not play the games. And I, I wonder if they just won't find, like, a high school around there and just play the games. I mean, that's what would make sense to me is play it at a, at a, at a high school stadium – what what what's weird though is that it's because this I guess the city's not allowing fans and the stadium and so this so it's like the team's not gonna play at home like they're just gonna cancel their two opening season home games because the, of the fan policy. <laughs> that doesn't make sense either. Is like how, okay, so I'm I was trying to think of this in my mind yesterday is like. So, like, Furman pulled their games from the well. But, see, there's not, that's not a fair comparison because Furman's not a state-supported school, so they can do what they want to with fans, I guess. But, like, Chattanooga is a state-supported school. Right. So they have to, you know, they, you know, they have to abide by, especially if they don't own the stadium, they have to abide by whatever Chattanooga's COVID laws are. <laughs> But like, if that what doesn't make sense is if that if that game is on campus, they could still have it and probably have a limited amount of fans, right? Yeah. I mean, that's that's what is bizarre to me because ETSU is allowing fans. I mean, you know, they're allowing I think twenty three hundred is what I saw, um, which they might not get that anyway. 
I'm just kidding. Right. They, they do draw pretty well. Um, but I guess, I guess they're, uh, from what I understand from their writer, Gene Henley, who I think does a great job. When I talked to him at the, the Furman game a few weeks ago, the, you know, there's a, Chattanooga is not real happy about their relationship with Finley Stadium and how it's gone since really the, the upgrades that I guess maybe they said they were going to, the city said they were going to make and they haven't done maybe. Is, and, and they kind of feel slighted a bit because there's a soccer team that plays there and, and, and other teams that draw more people. So the city caters to those teams more than they do maybe to Chattanooga. Mm-hmm. <laughs> So that's that's where some of the maybe the the relationship has soured, I guess you would say. Yeah, it's just a, it's an interesting <laughs> interesting storyline <laughs> that we're two weeks away or whatever from the yeah, yeah kickoff. And you would have thought you would have thought and and I know I think he wrote about it in January. It wasn't shortly thereafter and, and no one really believed at the time that that would be the case that well yeah, it turns out that he was right about it. I mean, he used, yeah. you know, at the time he didn't say it was a fact, but he said they were speculating. There was some speculation in that. And, and look, if, if that's the case, if, if, if I'm Chattanooga, shoot, might as well just play those games on the road. Yeah, I mean, at least they're getting play- – like, I just – what are they, Sanford and uh, – Sanford and Wofford. Just go to those two places. I mean, it, the kids – you don't. I don't think he was right to penalize the kids from a game. Right. It's not right to penalize, nor is it right to penalize Wofford or Sanford and say well, we're playing two less games. Now. Or, you know, yeah, we're playing one less game now. <laughs> and then speaking of dumb situations, Wofford, the only school in the league that has come out and said no fans at all. We're not going to do any fans for any sport, anyway, anytime. <laughs> no tailgating, <laughs> no families, nothing. <laughs> the COVID numbers are actually going down. <laughs> like, but. I guess, I mean, they, you know, I guess they're that worried about liability. It's been a tough week for Wofford fans. Yeah, or <laughs> distanced Wofford fans. Yeah. Between, Cardboard cutouts, whatever you want to talk about. Between, right between losing to VMI in overtime the other night and basketball. Which, and, and you, if you told me, I, you give me two out of three, if I'm a Wofford supporter, I mean, if you tell me I beat – now, granted, the one probably they lost wouldn't be VMI. <laughs> you tell me you beat Mercer, you know, Mercer, ETSU, and VMI, and you win two out of three of those, you're probably thinking, well, we beat Mercer and VMI or something. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but I mean, you know, still, I haven't said that. I mean, you got to be pretty happy with taking two out of three on yeah. the week. Oh, man. it's There's some, <laughs> there's some interesting stories. Uh, around so <laughs> yeah. and, and, yeah, so, and the season hasn't even kicked off yet. It's fun. I mean, I always like to read the fans. You know, the, you know, the Wofford fans of basketball, like, well, how's Furman? Those only played like it's up to Furman. How many SoCon games they play? <laughs> I mean, that's, you know, you need to go to the SoCon office on that. I mean, um, and there's nothing, I mean, pretty much everybody's understanding, like, this is a crazy year. I mean, if it was a normal year, I mean, people might be more upset. Yeah, about it, no, it's yeah. It's just kind of funny. It's, you know, it's a, a yeah, you know, it's a different circumstance. Um, I don't know. We still got a couple of weeks before, before that, uh, before the FCS uh, SOCON season kicks off February 20th. But, John, as one football season is set to begin, We've got one that's getting ready to end. It is Super Bowl Sunday this this Sunday, John. It is the big daddy. It is yep. Super Bowl, what, 55? Is that what we're up to, 56? What are we up to now? Uh, 50. 55. We're up to 55. I it's 55. Yep. Super Bowl 55 in Tampa between I Kansas mean, City well, and Tampa's Tampa Bay, been, man. Tampa's going to. They've been pretty dominant in pro sports. <laughs> Tampa Bay, the the Lightning win the uh, the Stanley Cup in hockey. The, the the Rays make it to the World Series and but lose to the Dodgers. And now Tampa Bay, the Buccaneers in the Super Bowl, taking on defending champions Kansas City. So it, it, this is going to be a good one. These two teams met earlier on in the year. Kansas City was able to win that one by a twenty seven. 
24 margin, uh, on, in, incredibly enough, on the road at Raymond James Stadium. So there's some uh, similarities uh, already as, as we get set for this game, which is the first time in, in history uh, of the Super Bowl, John, that a, a team from the host city will – be playing in their own stadium so <laughs> they can't fire the cannon yeah and the nfl said that uh, because they want to try to make it a neutral side that uh, tampa bay's not allowed to fire off by the, the, Tampa Day, the chiefs yeah incredible <laughs> no but um but I mean, it's gonna be a, it's gonna be a good one I, I, it's gonna be an interesting game look the lions only three points in favor of kansas city which I get. I mean, I guess if if Tom Brady weren't on the other sideline, I think it's probably a little bit higher. But I think I think uh, Vegas is trying to get a good point earlier. He told me this has the feeling of you remember when Green Bay won it the year before. Okay, and and they went back and then they played Denver. I mean, uh, and and it was John Elway's last game back in the uh, back in the nineties. Yeah. Yeah, so like he was like that feels like a lot like this for the Chiefs, where I mean it's not Tom Brady's last game, but you know it's well, like it wasn't it wasn't Elway's last game because Elway went and won another Super Bowl the next year against Atlanta. Well, I thought it was Brian Greasy was their quarterback, but I don't know. Mm-hmm. Um, no, Elway won ended up winning two because he beat Atlanta the very next okay. year. Okay, yeah, I know they won the next year, but I didn't think he was. The yep. But um. Okay, so like he said, it and, and, and compared it a little bit to Peyton Manning. Yeah. Because, uh, you know, and that Super Bowl that against, last year at Denver. Against, um, yeah. And, and, and then the, the Peyton, yeah, with, uh, with, against Carolina. Right. And, and remember the year before that, they got destroyed by the Seahawks. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And yes. Uh, he got destroyed in the game by the Seahawks. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, so I, I thought that was a pretty good comparison to what you know sort of what tom brady you know i I don't think it's his final year but it's you know we're obviously getting down there i mean he's he's not gonna play i don't think he's gonna play 10 more years obviously i I, I, I could see him playing another year or two yeah i don't think he plays what he's 43 this is this will likely be his last chance at a super bowl if we're honest about it, yeah. Uh, uh, unless he sticks around in in you know Tampa Bay is able to to do something next year, but I, I, I you're you're right. Th- this really sort of does feel like a last hurrah for him. A- at the same time, they're going up against a a tough. I mean this this may be the t- Tom Brady's place. They might be facing Tom Brady of the future. <laughs> Right Look, now. Brady's faced some good teams in Super Bowls. This He's is by far, yeah. This is this is by far a different monster. <laughs> Look, this is this isn't Eli Manning in the New York John the, the New York Giants, like, right? <laughs> and and you, I'll make a good comparison. To, okay, so remember, I guess it was Brady's first Super Bowl with the Patriots when they beat against the Rams. Maybe for, uh, yeah, yeah. Against was it? Yeah, against the Rams. Yep. So that offense was sort of semi comparable to greatest this. show on turf, baby. Right, but th- but this is that offense on steroids. <laughs> like, you know, like this Chiefs offense, I feel like is was it 2.0 Dick, of yeah, that of it, that Rams offense? Dick Vermeil is like somewhere like <laughs> right, <laughs> like and in awe of this offense. Right, like he's probably shedding a tear somewhere because yeah. he cried all the time. Kurt Warner, it's probably like and they had like Isaac Bruce, and yes, like Marshall Falk, and you, they were Some just the unstoppable. Yeah, they were. Um, but then you know, and that was funny because you the what year was it? Was it that year they beat Tampa to get the Super Bowl and the score was like nine to six? <laughs> you remember that? And like Tampa had like Warren Sapp and. Um, you know, they were still pretty good. I think Trent Dilfer was their court, may have been their court. Well, it, it, we're coming up. It's been uh, nearly, nearly two, not quite two decades since Tampa won their last Super Bowl. Remember that one against the Raiders in which they just dominated 
the Rams yeah. in that game. That game wasn't even close. No, Rondé Barber had like a huge day on defense. The Barbers, yeah. And and on offense, didn't they have the, his brother as running back? Or did he play for the Giants? I think he played for the Giants. Yeah. But who was it? Was it uh, – who, who was the quarterback? Was it uh, – Oh, was it Doug? No. Uh, Doug. Was it? Oh, what's his name? The dude from Asheville. You know what I'm talking about? Uh, I think he was from Asheville. Oh, man. I'll have to Google it. I thought it was Doug something. Um, who was their quarterback in 2002? Was it 2000? It. Yeah, I'm look- it's 2003. I'm looking it up right here. Here we go. John Gruden was the coach. Yeah, and um, he actually – what used to be the coach of Oakland or the, the Raiders, LA Raiders, I guess it was in. All right. So let's see. Oh, back. Oh, Brad, oh, Brad, Brad Johnson. Johnson. Brad, Brad Johnson. Johnson. Right. And they had Mike Allstott on that Tampa Bay team. Oh, From a, Purdue. Yes. Yes. And Brad Johnson. That's right. Uh, he was a good serviceable quarterback. But you Rich, ever noticed the guy that wins the Super Bowl? Like, there have been guys out there that like win it like Brady, and then you'll have like a you know Jeff Hostetler or something like <laughs> <laughs> some guy that just comes out of nowhere Jeff and Hostetler. wins the Super Bowl. <laughs> I mean, like, are you know, like, you're just somebody that like Trent Dilfer? Like, who talks about that guy? Like, you know, <laughs> Joe. He Flac- won a Super Bowl. Joe Flacco. Yeah. Oh, I mean, like, man. it's it's crazy how many of these just, like, normal dudes win Super Bowls. Like, trying, not, trying, not guys you would think of as being stars. Yeah, I'm trying to I think guess. of, the like, the last one to do it. Because maybe, maybe Dilfer. Yeah, was, maybe Dilfer with the... Uh, uh, I don't know, but I mean, no, because Brad Johnson, that would have been after. So maybe right. maybe Brad Johnson would have been the last one. I mean, like know. Rich Gannon was <laughs> the Raiders quarterback in the game. I think. Yeah, Rich Gannon. Yeah, and Jerry Rice played for Oakland. <laughs> right. Like, and you're like, who's Rich Gannon? He went to the University of Delaware, right? <laughs> yeah, he did. Um, but like there's just been some really bizarre quarterback matchups over the years. But this one's gonna be good. I mean, you've got oh, yeah. Tom Brady. Yeah, to it. Tom Brady versus Patrick Mahomes. I mean, th- th- we could have a shootout. I mean, honestly, we we really could. Now, really, yeah, we could. And what's crazy about it? You think about the quarterbacks that have won it, like I just mentioned. Think about the guys who haven't won it, like Dan Marino, and like Dan never know, like, even got to one, right? And like, uh, what's it? Uh, the the old Buffalo quarterback, uh, Jim. Uh, what's his name? Uh, mm-hmm. Um. Oh God! You would, um... Jim. Uh, keep on to say what's his name. Anyway, you know what I'm talking about. Um, so like Dan Marino's been there. Jim Kelly, or he's not been. Yeah, he went two to one. Jim Dan Ke- Marino won. Jim Kelly. Yeah. No, no, Dan never played in the Super Bowl. I think he played. Didn't he play the 49ers as a rookie? Isn't that right? Against, uh, I don't think so. I, 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 19, it was like 1982. I think he played in, I think he was like, he set the rookie record for touchdowns. Okay, Dan, he, he did play in one Super Bowl, Super Bowl, um, 19 against the 49ers and lost. You're right. You're right. And then, like, he never went back. Like, everybody was like, oh, he'll be back year after year. Nope. Yeah, here's actually a, a whole article on NBC Sports about best quarterbacks to never win a Super Bowl. Dan Marino, you mentioned. Jim Kelly went to four straight, couldn't get it done. Fran Tarkenton, back in the day wow. of the old yeah. Vikings. The old scrambler oh, himself. Dan Fouts of the Chargers. That's a good one. Wow, yeah, that's a good one. He threw it, he threw it all over the place, too. Warren Moon. Yeah, that's a good the Oilers. Yeah. Former Washington Husky. Yeah. Vinny oh. Testaverde. Vinny. Uh, Vinny and the Jets. Remember when like Chris Berman was good and he used to sing that? Steve Air McNair. 
Yeah, that remember he came up like a half yard short in, yep, Super Bowl. in that Super Bowl. That was a great Super Bowl. Donovan Mc, Donovan McNabb. That was a good Super Bowl against the Patriots that year, like oh five. Yeah, that was. I always thought he'd win one. You know, I thought he and when they had him and To, I was just like, they're gonna win one. I think and they and they couldn't. They couldn't get it done. But you know, Tom Brady came up big. There. I mean, it, Drew Brees only ended up with one, didn't he? Yeah, Drew Brees has only got – he's only – yeah, he, he beat Indianapolis that year. Aaron Rodgers only has one. Um, How many Brett Favre win? One? One. Yeah. Jeez, that's hard to – you know, you think of a guy like Tom Brady and how many he's gotten. <laughs> Six. And then you look at a guy like Favre or Aaron Rodgers and they've only won it once, won you know? Once. Yeah, there's not been – oh, there's not been many – Um. How about that stat, to, though? To win multiple, though. Tom Brady has been to more Super Bowls than every single franchise in the NFL. <laughs> How ridiculous is that? Like, I think, of, like, that's just, that, like, dominates every franchise ever. <laughs> oh, he's been to more Super Bowls than, than we've been to as a franchise. <laughs> I mean, like, the one stat that he'll have for – you know, a long time is that whole he'll have done that. Like whether not, he wins or loses, it's it not technically true because the New England Patriots, as an entire organization, have been to eleven. Well, but he was the quarterback. But <laughs> well, but they, like they went to they went to two Super Bowls before he was the quarterback. Yeah, against the Bears, eighty five and ninety six when they lost to the right. Packers. But I like. But with, if you subtract him from wherever he's been, you know, I, I they said I, maybe it wasn't that stat, but like he accounts for like what five of their seven appearances or whatever. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Super um, Bowl responsibility <laughs> should be a stat. Um. All right, John. Fun fact here: there's four teams that are unbeaten in Super Bowls. Can you name them? Unbeaten in Super Bowls, they're probably like one and oh. <laughs> Three of them are one and oh, yes. Th and Tampa then, Bay, yep. Um, New Orleans, yep. And well, this is going to be hard. Um, Tampa Bay, New Orleans, and uh, I have no idea. Let's see, the Jets. The Jets, yes. Joe Namath. 1968. Good Lord, it's been a long time for right. them. There's only one there's only one franchise that is two and zero in Super Bowl appearances. Two and oh. Uh man, I, I don't know. The Baltimore Ravens. Wow. Yeah, that's right. Because they went from two thousand and then they they yeah. went what seven years and got, or no, ten years and got back. In 2012, they got back. Or 2012, yeah, and got back and won. That was a great Super Bowl too. That was the one the power went out in. And remember, like San Francisco yep. was controlling the game, and then all of a sudden the power went out for like 45 minutes. <laughs> and they um, come back and Baltimore wins. Uh, there's four teams, John, that have never been to a Super Bowl. Yeah, that's probably going to be Jacksonville. Yep. Uh, the Houston Texans. Yep. Um, four teams that have never been to the Super Bowl. Uh, the Cleveland Browns. Yes. Oh, I've got three or four. I can't even. I can't believe I've made it this far. I feel like there's a. There's an NFC East team maybe in here somewhere, but maybe not. The Detroit, uh, the Detroit Lions. The Detroit Lions, yeah. Wow. You'd have thought of those franchises, you'd have thought Cleveland and been, would have been to one. I mean, I know they went to like when Jim Brown was like, they went to the championship game or one. You know, but like you would have thought they would have gone to, they've had some of the worst luck of any franchise. And they could have very well. They're probably going to be the team that, when this thing's all said and done, 
might be the team that came closest to knocking off the Chiefs. You know, if you think about it. All right, uh, I'm going to try to quiz you here. Of teams that have won a Super Bowl, okay, so not teams that have been in, in that, like like right. Carolina that have been twice but haven't won. So teams right. that have at least won one Super Bowl but have been multiple times, who has the worst winning percentage? <laughs> Dave, I do have at least won one. I had to at least won one but have been to multiple. Ooh, that's a good question. Probably Denver or maybe. You're close. Denver's down there because Denver's three of eight in Super Bowl. Maybe the Chiefs. Uh, God, the Chiefs have been to like, well, it, they didn't. Let's see. Chiefs have won one, but they've only been to like, I think, two. So um, maybe three. Uh, let me think. God, that would be. Washington, maybe? I mean, they've been to, like, a bunch, haven't they? And, uh, Washington actually has a uh, over 500 record in Super Bowls. New England? <laughs> no, New England. New, not New nah, England. that's true. Uh, the St. Louis or Los Angeles Rams. Okay. Are so one, they're going are one for okay. Are one for four in Super Bowl appearances. Yeah, that's kind of crazy. I, you know, I... Because I didn't even think about they had been with the Rams when they were the L.A. Rams before. Yep, the 79 back with Eric Dickerson was part of that. One of those times they played, uh, they were in the – I forgot who they were playing in the Super Bowl, and they they came close to winning, and and like their tight end had like a broken arm or something in the game. I think it was that young blood guy. And that, that might have been in 79, but they won it in 99 and then lost in 2001 and then lost two years ago. That's right. Because that was the worst Super Bowl ever. <laughs> yeah, it was like 10 to 7 or something. It's like, <laughs> like, like the people are watch, I was watching it with her, like, man, we, we'll never get that three hours back or four hours. <laughs> Such a. That was one instance to where both the halftime show and the game were bad. All right, I'm gonna take uh, I'm gonna take the the Patriots out of this because they've been to so many. But who, which which franchise has given up the most points in all of their Super Bowl appearances? I would I, just off the top of my head, I would guess the Buffalo Bills. <laughs> they're they're actually up there, but no Denver. Denver, yeah, that's right. Because because it didn't like San Francisco dropped like fifty five on yeah. one year. I'm pretty and, like sure. Dallas. I'm pretty, pretty bad. Yeah. Yeah. All of those years, like in the early, like in the early like mid and mid eighties, they just Joe got... Montana threw like eight touchdowns in <laughs> one of those yeah. Super Bowls. Yeah. Oh, it's it's fantastic. Um, I was yeah, that's. I mean, like, I think Denver, they they lost four before they ever won one, I think. Or you, three. You're right. Because um, uh, they, they didn't they win lost, until that Green Bay Super Bowl. They lost four in a row, or, like, they lost four appearances in a row before winning in 97, 98. Lost in 2013, that drubbing by Seattle. Oh, then, Yeah. <laughs> That's another one. Seattle dropped like 55 <laughs> yeah. on them. <laughs> yeah. And like, it was like over by halftime. You know, like, because, yeah. like, at the end of the first, I think that that Super Bowl, I want to say, like, I want to say, like, it was either the one of the, the son of, is it Joe Buck? was either doing it or Al Michaels, and he was just like, well, you don't want to get behind four scores in the first half. <laughs> and I was like, well, that, you know, that's probably true. Yep. It's probably not a good thing to get Den- Denver, Denver actually holds the record for the worst loss of a Super Bowl. Was that San Francisco game? Yep. <laughs> Wasn't it like 55 to 14? 55 to 10. 55 to 10. Cool. In the Superdome down in New Orleans. That would be like one you'd want to like, like if you played for that Denver team, you'd be like, yeah, well, we 
got there, but don't ask me about the game to your grandchildren. Because you know? yes. it, it was billed as the matchup of quarterbacks, and of course you had John Elway. And, like, hopefully this one doesn't turn out that way. No, I, I, I hope not. All right, John, only one Super Bowl has gone into overtime. Oh, ah, I think I know the answer to this. Is it the Falcons and Patriots? It is from 2016. The 28, the 28 to three <laughs> choking that was the Falcons, the biggest choke in Super Bowl history. Gosh, you know, like the fact that they've never. I think it shocks me that they didn't win that, but also the fact that they they got back there and, and maybe have been like a little bit. You'd have thought that'd have been a better game against Denver because they had, you know, they they beat an unbeaten, I believe, Minnesota team to get in the Super Bowl in the NFC Championship with Randy Moss <laughs> and, yep. and uh, was it Dante Culpepper as their quarterback? Maybe um, I don't know their quarterback, but they were like fifteen or sixteen and zero. I don't remember. It was like eighteen and zero, something like that. And no one gave Atlanta a chance and. Good old Martin Anderson kicked them into the Super Bowl, I think. So. Yep. All right, John, lowest combined score. That's got to be the – wait, okay. Let me, let me think about this. might be a trick question. That has to be the New England-LA game. It is. 16, 16 total points. God, that was horrible. 13-3, to 3, New England won that game. And it was like – like the Rams didn't get past the midfield like the whole night. It was like awful. Like, and they kept saying, like the broadcasters of that game were, were like, well, this is just, just just a symphony of a defensive scheme put together by Bill Belichick. And I'm like, no, it's not. This is awful. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> uh, highest combined score. Highest combined score. That's a good one. Um, wow. That, uh, I wonder if that happened in my life. It probably has happened in my lifetime. It was the, I'll give, go, you a, I'll give you a hint. It was the year I was born. If, which, you, if you know what year that is. 1986? No, no I'm not that old. <laughs> Gosh. That's my brother was it's born. That probably year. the San Francisco Denver game. It is not, it, but it does include San Francisco. But it was a different. Uh, but don't San think. Francisco. But don't think Montana. Think Steve Young. San Diego, San Francisco, nineteen ninety four season. The nineteen ninety five. It was in January nineteen ninety five. They put, right. The two teams combined for seventy five points. That was on the E sixty primetime documentary. Remember, forty nine to twenty six. <laughs> What a weird Super Bowl. <laughs> how did the Chargers, like, how did they ever get to a Super Bowl in my lifetime? <laughs> and they've, what, they've been to, was that the it? Was that the only one they've been to? Did Dan Fouts get one or not? No, no I don't no, think. No, 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 no. No, they've been to. I, I think they've been once to one. They beat Miami. Okay, so they've they been to Miami. one. That was it. That was it. That's only. That was to. it, yeah. yeah. That's it. They played like a nine overtime game with Miami to like almost get there one time. Play Dan Fouts as a quarterback. Fun, Cincinnati's fun. been what? Once? Twice? Cincinnati has been twice and they lost both games. They lost the heartbreaker and both two. games were to the 49ers, weren't they? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think they might have actually been the favorites. You know, on the one where they lost with Boomer Esiason. Boomer Esiason. What a great name. You would think a guy like that would win a Super Bowl. Name, like just off the top. If you knew nothing about football and you just looked at a list and you were like, tell me of the guys that won a Super Bowl, I would definitely pick Boomer Esiason as a, as a name that would be like, he was born to just win a Super Bowl. But it didn't happen. I'd have probably picked Vinny Testaverde though, too. Yeah. Vinny just sounds like a tough name. 
<laughs> Bernie Kozar. I'd probably never pick that guy. <laughs> Bernie, Bernie. <laughs> the sad part about Vinny Testaverde is he play, he he like played till like I feel like he was like forty seven or something and never won. <laughs> Mm -mm. I, that's probably not the truth, but like it feels like he played a lot longer than Tom Brady. Like, who's the oldest quarterback? It, it's got to be Tom Brady to ever play in the Super Bowl. I guess. Like, there have been other. No, no, I don't. I, I'm not. I'm not so sure about that. What? Who was who the charge? Who was the Chargers quarterback? Then? Thought he was pretty old. The Chargers quarterback back in '94. Yeah, I think Ladanian Tomlinson might have been their running back. Yeah. Uh, I don't think Ladanian was that old. Remember that? Was it was it the Chargers that drafted Ryan Leaf like a few years later? <laughs> Probably. That sounds like a <laughs> I move. Think it was. That sounds like a move they would have made. Uh, I know they Actually, drafted Breeze. I know they they I know they drafted. Who was Breeze. their quarterback in 1994? That's a no great idea. question. I don't know. Well, it's got to be another one of those guys that you just would never think of. <laughs> We've gone down the uh, the Super Bowl history road here, John. But real quick, but we're gonna get out of here. Um, Marion Butts may or may not have been the running back. <laughs> yeah. um, real quick, John, before we get out of here, Kansas City, Tampa Bay, who wins? Who do you got? Um, I got I got the young young gun Mahomes. I think he's primed. I think their offense is too good. Yeah. I think it'll be close for three quarters, and I think uh, Chiefs win by like a 34-24 game, something like that. Yeah, I'm gonna agree with you. I like Kansas City. I mean, I just I I just don't see how you stop stop that offense. Um, when they're clicking, they've already proven they can beat Tampa Bay. Uh, they did it earlier this season. Um. I, I think Mahomes outduels Brady. I, I think it's a little closer. I, I think Tom Dan Humphreys was the quarterback <laughs> don't of do the Chargers in the ninety four season. Don't even know who that is. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I wonder I couldn't remember. <laughs> I I think Kansas City wins thirty one twenty eight. I'm gonna go thirty one twenty eight. Yeah. Close so game. you're thinking close close game. close game. I Did think you see the guy before we get out of here that bet? Was it three point five million dollars yeah. they would cover? <laughs> That's it's a, like a furniture yeah. store owner. <laughs> That's awesome. If he and he's trying to win all the money back he lost from like the World Series or something. <laughs> got. That's too good. Interesting. Too good. Well, John, it's been uh, it's been great. We'll uh, have lots to talk about next week. Uh, obviously, we can recap the Super Bowl um, afterwards uh, next Thursday and. Uh, get into uh, a little bit more basketball and uh, be another week closer to spring football. Yeah. Looking forward to it. Um, obviously I had some fun with the Super Bowl tonight and. Oh yeah. Should have a, I, I think it'll be a good game. I'm I think so too. To yeah, I think so too. It's going to be a good one. Hope everybody out there enjoys uh, Super Bowl Sunday. I was, look, halftime, the commercials throughout the game. Good, it's going to be great. It's just good. I, I love Super Bowl commercials. Yeah, um, who, who doesn't yeah. love that? Like so, some of them. So it's going to be fun. I'm looking forward to it, John. But uh, get back next week. Hope everybody has a, a great week. Uh, enjoy the Super Bowl this weekend. This has been another episode of The Spread. Thanks for listening to The Spread Podcast here on Podbean. Head on over to thespreadfootball.com and check out all of our weekly articles and catch replays of each show on the podcast page. Also, head on over to social media and follow us on Facebook at The Spread with Cameron Tarrant and on Twitter at The Spread Podcast. We'll catch you next time.